Congressional Democrats' first hearings on the overturning of Roe v. Wade provoked this viral exchange between Senator Josh Howley and Berkeley law professor Kiara Bridges. Let's watch. Used a phrase, I want to make sure I understand what you mean by it. You've referred to people with a capacity for pregnancy. It, would that be women? Many women, cis women, have the capacity for pregnancy. Many cis women do not have the capacity for pregnancy. Um, there are also trans men who are capable of pregnancy, as well as non-binary people who are capable of pregnancy. So this isn't really a women's rights issue. It's a, it's, we can it's recognize a that this impacts women while also recognizing that it impacts other groups. Those things are not mutually exclusive, Senator Hawley. Oh, so your view is, is that the core of this, this right then is about what? So um, I want to recognize that your line of questioning um, is transphobic, <laughs> um, and it opens up trans people to violence by not recognizing that. Wow, you're saying that I'm opening up people to violence by asking whether or not women are the folks who can have pregnancies? So I'm one, I want to note that one out of five transgender uh, persons have attempted suicide. So I think it's important because of my line of questioning. Because so we can't talk about it because denying that trans people exist and pretending not to know that they exist. I'm is denying dangerous. that trans people exist by asking Are you? you if you're talking Are you? about women Are you? having pregnancies. Do you believe that the, uh, men can get pregnant? No, I don't think women can get <laughs> so you pregnant. are denying that trans people like this. Thing. And that leads to violence. Is this how you run your classroom? Are students allowed to question you Absolutely. or are they also treated like this? Where no, you, no, no, they're, they're told that to they're question. opening up people to oh, violence. We have a good time questioning. in my class. You should join. Oh, I bet. You might learn a lot. Wow, I, I would learn a lot. I've learned you, a lot I just know. in this exchange. Absolutely. Extraordinary. So this exchange went extremely viral on social media yesterday and uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's what some, I forget who came up with this, I think it was Scott Alexander, who's on Substack, uh, a, a scissor episode where if you're on one team, so both sides saw this as a victory. So I think people who are conservative, who are sympathetic to the argument Josh Hawley was making, thought he did a fantastic job and he really put that woman in her place. And I think people who think, uh, who are liberal or who are uh, on the pro-transgender side think she she got him. She was great, uh, which maybe that's the best case scenario if everybody's happy and we could just all walk away. But uh, what well, did you no, think about this I certainly don't think so. Well, I don't know what a pro-transgender side is. I would hope that everyone, including Josh Hawley, given that he's in a responsibility of overseeing the lives of people you know, in his jurisdiction that are trans, that he is pro them having all of the rights and interests that, of everybody else that lives there. But look, I think that people like this professor handling lines of inquiry like this are exactly why the liberals are in trouble. Mm -hmm. I, I think she handled it very poorly. She, she started out okay. He asked her a question about language, which frankly is not difficult to understand, in which I think him asking it reveals something about him. So saying, what was it, um, uh, people who have a capacity for birth. Many, many, many people who are cis women do not have the capacity for birth. Our, both of our mothers, I would gather about an age where they are no longer have the capacity for, the, mm -hmm. for birth. Most girls below the age of 13 or so do not have the capacity for birth. Many people are infertile and don't have the capacity for birth. It goes on and on and on. The idea, even if you don't, if trans people are not a part of this conversation, it's absurd. It makes you look like a Luddite who doesn't understand basic science to ask big, serious questions about what it means to characterize people who have the capacity for birth as a separate category from all cis women who, again, do not all have the capacity mm -hmm. for birth. He su she subsequently adds that it's also the case that trans men can have the capacity for birth. He picks up on this aspect of it and says, you know, so men, you know, then they have that colloquy about how can men um, give birth. Now, everything she said up to then, then, while I think that her tone was probably not most conducive to her being heard, was accurate and fine and not problematic. But when he then asked the follow-up question, which she had a good answer for, he asked one of these like kind of hypothetical nothing questions. Then she, she accuses him of to, violence. You're doing a violence, all right. of this kind of that thing. That was the uh, you know, part no where need, I thought it went no downhill. There's no need for that. that. Right. And she, she was like Because then he rightly face. pushes back. So you're saying that by me asking you questions about this and, and, and probing the language we're using, I am causing violence, which is a ridiculous accusation. Yeah, all, all you need to do is ask, you know, do you think it's appropriate, you know, to use medically accurate language? Do, do you think mm -hmm. it's, you know, useful? I think personally it's useful to use medically accurate language to describe 
you know, people who have the capacity for birth. Now, then he says, that, is this a women's issue? That was the question that I think triggered folks a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, is this then not a, a women's issue? There are many issues that we consider to be women's issues or black issues or Latino issues that aren't specifically germane to those groups. Criminal justice reform is broadly considered to be a black issue. It's hardly the case that police are only running around shooting, killing, and well, abusing black people. No, I, I, agree. I say know. that all the time. Actually, I've criticized the framing of criminal justice issues as exclusively a, a, a race as, as issue. Is the framing as have I. the implicit, the explicit framing really of Black Lives Matter? Right. Well, like, but that's the thing. You can talk about the ways that things disproportionately mm -hmm. affect groups, and I think it's historically it's been important to do so because oftentimes you can design policies in ways that don't necessarily get at the biggest effect, the people who are harmed the most, if you're not cognizant of the way that different policies are addressing different communities, whether it's rural communities versus urban communities, the North versus the South, black people versus white people. There's all different kinds of ways that you have to pay attention to what's going on to make sure that the policy is doing what it's supposed to do and not leaving anybody out. But howly pretending that something being disproportionately affecting, uh, having a di disproportionate effect on cis women and therefore calling it a women's issue is somehow like confusing. That's where I would have stayed instead of going on this frolic and detour about violence. It's like, of course, um, Holly, you know, it, it's still, it is a women's issue because it disproportionately affects women. But of course, there are other people, there are many women who it doesn't affect. And there are people who do not identify as women who are also affected by it. That should have been the end of it. Well, Senator Hawley later joined Sean Hannity on Fox News and said this of the exchange. Here is the modern Democrat Party today, Sean. It is that you have to say that men can get pregnant. And if you don't say it, then you are a bigot and you are responsible for violence. I mean, that is the party line. Let's not forget who invited this witness. She was there as a Democrat witness. You didn't see a single Democrat disagree with that. In fact, they're all over social media applauding her and saying, oh, that's exactly right. It's not exactly right, it's exactly crazy, which is why voters are running screaming away from the Democrat party. This is craziness. Yeah, I think the it's the pivot to violence, which is a common tactic when this is brought up. You're, I'm accused of it all the time, even though, I mean, we had this, we had a debate on the show last week about uh, Elliot Page and the dead naming and what the Twitter policy was. And, I, and by the way, I ne despite being accused of it, I never, de I never dead named Elliot Page, et cetera. Um, I don't advocate doing that. I advocate treating people with civility and respect. I, what, we were debating was what the policy should be. On Twitter, yeah. And I, I, I think yeah, a policy for people who yeah. are of public, of public significance where you can't recognize uh, the name under which they started their lives and careers seemed very silly to me. While you can still, the fact that it was trending, sure, that's, that was uncivil. But that aside, um, it goes, to, I got accused of this, all that, and Kim got a lot of this too, that we were like, you know, we're fostering violence against this community, and you can't show that. And I said that on the show, and it's still true. The the because the statistics are often thrown at me that there's so many, there's so much murders of trans people, the number of people, but the, they are not <laughs> almost, entirely, like 100% of them are not the result of anti-trans bigotry, yeah. which is not to say that anti-trans bigotry hasn't affected them in their lives, but this very direct causal link between Th things like what Josh Hawley said and saying there's this massive epidemic of, 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 vi of shootings and stabbings against this community because of that is not true. It's, right. That connection so does not here's, exist. Here's, here's the frustration. There was, for example, a news story within the last few days where uh, a trans man asked what restroom he should use because he didn't want to upset anybody. And he was told, you have female genitalia go into the women's room. He said, okay. He goes into the women's room, but he presents his mail. Some women start screaming and saying, you're not supposed to be, you know, some cis women start screaming and saying, you're not supposed to be in there. And a bunch of cis men come in and beat him up. And now we have one of these, he, he literally did what people say he's supposed to do, right? The whole concern is about trans people in women's bathrooms and da 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 da, and we don't want you know, women in the men's bathroom, we don't want all that. Okay, so he asked and did what he was told, and he still ended up getting beat up by a bunch of cis men who said that he was somehow lecherous for being in the women's bathroom. Okay, this was a story. It's a story that is covered somewhat on the left and in liberal spaces, not at all discussed um, by the right or even in this space. So when people are focusing on this kind of language at this hearing, it becomes frustrating that the real life world viol real world violence that is ongoing against the trans community isn't being foregrounded in the same way. 
However, it is also true that there's a very tenuous connection between any one instance of transphobic speech or language, even something as, I think, vile as what uh, Jordan Peterson was doing, and a specific instance of hate against trans people. That's not how things work. It's a kind of a, a loosening of public um, um, uh, uh, what seems to be publicly socially acceptable and how we te we're teaching each other how to treat each other in these spaces. And I think having conversations about these kind of discourses does remove us from having a conversation about well, how do we actually feel about trans people? Mm -hmm. Do we think trans people should be beat up? That's, so I wish somebody would ask. Nobody me. should be beaten well, up. Of, of course not, but that's not the conversation here with I'm not, sure the trans, I'm not sure the trans activist people yelling at me actually agree with that. They think I should be beat up and no one Well, and then maybe, and that's part of the problem too, I, I think. Even Which is something though, weird about this debate, where people, uh, you know, yeah. screaming at me on Twitter that I should be more civil, even though again I did not use I. No, the, I understand. Are screaming at me and, and, and also tell you know saying not that I not that my feelings are hurt. I don't care, but right. not being civil in the way they talk about this. If we're going to be right. civility police, well, all the, of a the frustration is that the, the she the the woman the professor there the Berkeley professor seemed immediately on edge with Josh Haley, and I don't know what was happening before what their conversation was like before, and if he had said anything before, but. I know being in these spaces, there are often things that are said and done which I find to be personally immoral, abhorrent, unconstructive, etc. But you also have to consider when you're in a public space like that how you're going to be perceived. And all of the baggage you're bringing to the conversation is not useful if it makes you seem like you're the aggressor and the other person is the reasonable one. And you're not going to be able to make a, a case for why it is that we need to be careful about how we characterize a community that's already, yes, under threat and exposed to a lot of violence if you are the one that's coming off as hostile. And that's what's frustrating here because I do think that oftentimes the liberal interlocutors that are put forward to make the case for these things are not making the best case they're not sending their best. And it ultimately comes at the detriment to trans people. One last thing I'll say quickly, I was doing my call-in show the other night and talking about the episode here on, on, on Rising with Ole and, and all of that. And the, the trans caller made the point that, you know, in their community, they live with a bunch of other trans people. In their community, they don't even use words like that. They, they, had, they said they just heard about this thing, chest feeding. They had never even heard of that phrase before. But they feel like there's all of this and antipathy being stirred up against them in their community because of language that is largely academic, largely niche, and has nothing to do with them and what their political priorities are, which are often working class political priorities because they're often kicked out of their homes, marginalized from jobs, and, and are, are kind of economically precarious. And so, you know, the same thing that happens with black groups and a lot of other things. We were talking about the Latinx stuff yesterday and Jill Biden. There is, I think, a scourge of academics framing these conversations in a way that makes them feel good and which I substantively often agree with, but which is harmful to the groups that they are purporting to represent because it is the most out of touch and often triggering way to talk about these groups and it misrepresents what their political interests are. Well, thank you for that, Brianna. We'll have more rising right after this. Actually, the panel will join us, so stick around.